Hello and welcome to Lily of the Valley. I'm your host, David Inark. I have no idea what this game is about, but, uh, I, well, I mean, I read a little bit about it. You're a guy and his mother passed away and you meet this girl named Lily. So I thought this might be kind of cool, something a little different. All right, let's start a new game. This is a visual novel and, um, okay, funerals, great. I hate funerals. Then again, I think most people do. I can't imagine anybody genuinely enjoying them. Uh, okay, so I'm probably covering part of the words. There's not much of a party atmosphere at funerals, and everyone has to wear black. People sit on pews in neat little rows, their heads bowed in suitable solemnity, <laughs> and listen as a priest gives a long talk. Oh. This priest is a grave-looking man with high cheekbones and, though I feel ashamed for even thinking this, looks a little like a villain from a Disney film. He talks about what a treasure the deceased was and how deeply valued they were by all in the community and what a great loss their tragic passing is. Her passing wasn't tragic. If anything, it sounds comical, something stupid that might happen in a sketch show, but not in real life. She choked on a muffin. Not even a nice muffin like chocolate or blueberry. Bran. Banana and bran, to be more precise. I suppose that's to be expected, though. That she choked on an unpleasant muffin? I mean, not that she choked on a muffin to begin with. Nobody could have predicted that. But she was on a diet. I don't really know why. I thought she looked fine. But... I didn't know a lot about her. I can count the number of times I've been back home over the last decade on one hand. Ever since I went to university, then got a job, I haven't had the time. London's pretty far away, and travel costs are so expensive, and anyway, it's hard to get time off from work, and there was no real pressing reason for me to return either. Though my parents were starting to get on in years, they were still healthy. They worked full-time jobs, they went for long walks in the countryside, and they always made time to watch my sister compete in her netball tournaments. They were just fine. Well, I thought they were fine. Then my mother choked to death on a muffin, and here I am now. You can't make it up. Real life can be more unexpected and more inexplicable than stories sometimes. My sister trembles on my left, my great aunt Enid on my right. She's wearing something that looks like an old net curtain. Great aunt Enid sniffs, stabbing her eyes with her handkerchief. I can't tell whether she's crying or if she just has something stuck in her eye. Should I hold Hazel's hand? She's only 18. That's far too young. This is her first funeral. Not like me. I've seen several funerals in my time. I guess that's to be expected when you're this old. The first was my mother's mother, Grandma Rose. When I was, I was four when it happened, and I didn't really understand what was going on. After that came Grandpa Len, Great Aunt Henrietta, and her family's friend, Aunt Ruth. She wasn't a real aunt, but she took care of me so often when I was a child, she might as well have been. She died on a holiday in Spain, slipped and fell in the shower, banged her head. She didn't get back up. I think dying in the shower must be a particularly undignified way to go, especially for a woman like Aunt Ruth. She was always shy. I wonder... What would be more or less embarrassing than dying in a cozy cafe on Stafford Street surrounded by gopping onlookers? I don't know. Maybe it isn't for me to judge. Ranking deaths in order of ridiculousness is probably quite a callous thing to do at a funeral. Cassandra said I was callous. Eh, she might have had a point. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. Hazel's eyes are wet. She sniffs, wiping her tears away with the back of her arm. 
I'm her big brother. I should hold her hand. Isn't that my job? To provide comfort and companionship? But the gap between her hand and mine seems so large. It's like a chasm, completely insurmountable. Why am I here? Why am I sitting on this wooden pew in this uncomfortable black suit that's slightly too small for me? I don't like wearing suits. They're so impersonal. You can use them for anything. Weddings, funerals, christenings, even standing as the accused in court. Suits might make you look a little smarter, but they don't really mean anything. This is a farce, a joke. I don't see my parents for a year, and when I do, it's like this? In a suit in a church with my mother in a casket? No way. I can't even bring myself to cry. It's all too ridiculous. Choking on a banana and bran muffin. Who could cry over something like that? Chapter 2, Risk I still can't believe it, says Hazel, and she's not the only one, neither can I. It's only been five hours since our mother's body was burnt and scattered to the wind, and we, me, my father, and my sister, sat around the kitchen table playing Risk. Risk is one of those strange games that almost every middle-class family seems to own, but nobody actually likes. I mean, playing it takes far too long, and either people don't take it seriously at all, or they take it far too seriously, often resulting in arguments and accusations, being flung from one side of the table to the other. Maybe that's why we're playing it. I don't know, it's some strange form of self-punishment. It might seem boorish or crass, even sensitive even, to play a board game that's actually fun, like Pluto or Cranium, on the same day our mother's corpse was cremated. There, there, dear, says Dad, looking slightly more disheveled than usual. We all have to go someday. Your mother was just... Ah. His voice catches in his throat and he looks pained. It was just unfortunate, that's all. He finishes. No, that's not what I meant, says Hazel, shaking her head. I, I meant the priest. He... Do you think he looked like a villain from the Disney film, I asked. Really? Yeah, like that guy from The Hunchback of Notre Dame. You know, the kinky one. Well, now you say it, I kind of see it. Hazel laughs, but not for very long. Maybe she feels too guilty to laugh. That is why we're playing Risk, after all. I just meant that priest, he... Hazel pauses, a pained expression on her face. He kept saying Mum's name wrong. Her name is Eve, not Evelyn. Nobody called her Evelyn. Why? At her funeral. Her shoulders shake, and she looks like she's going to cry. It was Mum's funeral. It was supposed to be about her, but he couldn't even get her name right. Hazel, dear. Hazel, says Dad. He embraces Hazel, but it doesn't curb her tears. If anything, they seem to intensify. That guy no knew nothing about Mum. Absolutely nothing, she says. And I'm using the wrong voice. He'd never met her before in his life. Yet he had the nerve to stand there, acting so important, pretending that he cared about her as much as we do. And he couldn't even get her name right. I know, dear, I know. Dad tries to placate her, patting her on the back gently. That's just how funerals are, I'm afraid. They're only a formality. But it shouldn't be like that. It was Mum, and she died, and... and I know, I know, says Dad. He rests his chin on top of Hazel's hand, letting her cry into his shoulder. I'm getting old. I've been to enough funerals to know the priests don't have to care. They're just doing their jobs. That's all there is to it, he says tiredly. Yeah, at least it's not as bad as great Aunt Henrietta's funeral, I say, attempting to lighten the mood. Well, what do you mean, asks Hazel, blinking away her tears. Her face is wet and crumpled. 
It's like it's been through the washing machine. Her eyes are rimmed red and her eyelashes are stuck together in clumps. I should have held her hand. Why didn't I hold her hand? I try to offer her a smile, but it feels awkward and unnatural. They kept calling great Aunt Harry Henrietta Harriet. Really? asked Hazel. Really? Everyone got pretty mad. Ah, Dad nods his head. I remember that. Didn't your great Aunt Enid want to file a formal complaint? I think so, but nah, nothing came of it. I don't know if great Aunt Enid had a leg to stand on, since she thought Aunt Henrietta was called her Hermione. Hermione? Great, I can't even say it. <laughs> the three of us laugh a little, but it's a half-hearted, half-formed, and fleeting. I know the feeling. The laughter disappears discordantly, without a trace, making us all feel uncomfortable in the aftermath. We're up to part three already. I have no idea how long this is. Cassandra. Okay. A couple of years ago, I used to go out with a woman called Cassandra. It wasn't a serious relationship. There were no declarations of endless love and no plans for marriage. We just went out for drinks a couple of times a week or occasionally to a film. Sometimes we went back to my place and had sex and that was it. We were only together for five months, and it was brief and fleeting. Not worth getting upset over. I didn't really like her all that much, even though she was quite pretty. She had a nice smile and nice teeth, too. But in all that time, though we went to my apartment several times, I never saw the inside of hers. Not once. She said it was because she had a dog at home. Her little Buddy, a stupid American name, and he was her baby. She said she didn't want Buddy to see us having sex. It would be unethical. It would be kind of child abuse, you know, was what she always said, but I never really got it. I mean, couldn't she just lock the bedroom door? Oh no, I could never do that. Buddy's like my baby. What mother would lock her own baby out of the bedroom? It's unethical. Cassandra said that a lot, about all kinds of things. She couldn't eat veal, it was unethical. She couldn't buy eggs from battery hens, it was unethical. She couldn't support gay marriage, it was unethical. And also unnatural, but she had nothing against people who were, um, like that, you know. But that didn't stop her from going to KFC every once in a while. Cassandra often joked about her name. She said it was all-knowing, all-seeing, like the prophet. What prophet? I remember asking her. The Greek prophet, Cassandra, able to see the future but cursed with never being with never being believed. I think that's kind of like me. Really? Really? Everything I say always comes true. It's the power of positive thinking. Cassandra was also a therapist, and she believed strongly in the powers of positive thinking. Being able to force yourself out of a rut through sheer willpower. It all starts with the brain. The brain is an incredible muscle. You just need to learn to love yourself. Yeah, I wasn't so sure. Loving myself is kind of hard when I get told every day at work that I'm the scum of the earth, I told her. She just sighed and said something vague and unhelpful like, I sense that there is a lot of negative energy surrounding you. I told her that of course there was, and what did she expect? Didn't she know that I worked in a call center? Maybe you should quit your job, was Cassandra's invaluable advice. It sounds like it's upsetting you. Well, yeah, I think that's kind of inevitable. You need to be made of steel not to get worn down doing my job. I see, I see. Cassandra would say that as though she really did see, just like the Greek prophet. I, however, had my doubts. You know, there's something I do with my patients when they're feeling blue. It's an exercise in positive thinking. Wow, sounds great. Oh, come on, don't be like that. You haven't even tried it yet. Neither did I want to, but I knew I didn't have a choice. 
You're going to make me, aren't you? Don't be silly. I'm not going to make you do anything. You're my partner, not my patient. I, I know, but... I just want to help you out. Make you feel better. Turn that frown upside down. Though she said she wasn't going to make me do anything, Cassandra could be quite persuasive when she wanted to be. She got me to write down a list of my perceived negative qualities on a piece of scrap paper, then write opposing positive things on a different sheet of paper. For instance, if my perceived negative quality was something like, I'm an awful son and I haven't seen my mother in a whole year and I keep putting off calling her because I feel like I'm an embarrassment, I would write, I finished university with a 2.1 in my degree, and my mother told me she'd never been prouder of me during my graduation. On the positive sheet of paper. It sounded difficult. I told Cassandra I didn't want to do it. Couldn't we watch TV or something instead? But she was insistent. She said I was just trying to run away from my problems. She said that, she, she said that was called avoidance. And although it was a suitable coping mechanism in some cases, it would be far healthier to deal with my problems head on. Uh, look, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Look, I'll do a list too. That way you won't have to feel alone, she said. I guess. And so Cassandra and I worked on our lists, filled with both pos positive and negative qualities about ourselves. The negatives were easy. The positives were a lot harder. Right, said Cassandra once we had both finished. Now, we have to tear the negative sheet of paper up. Uh, tear it up? Yeah, that's right. This list represents all your negative thoughts. Thoughts that are making you unhappy. It's pointless to dwell upon them, especially when they can easily be flipped around by the powers of positive thinking. For instance, Cassandra tapped a pointed fingernail against her list, directing my gaze at one of the points she had written down. Interested in any hidden secrets Cassandra might have buried away beneath her bright smile, I looked. Her negative list was far shorter than mine, and what Cassandra had written was this. Worried about Buddy. I think he might be sick. I remember feeling distinctly cheated as I read through those two sentences written in Cassandra's loopy cursive handwriting. Worried about Buddy? That wasn't a negative point about Cassandra. That was her being concerned about the health of her dog. I'm sorry, her baby. I stared at Cassandra's list, then my own, comparing them over and over. I felt more and more dysfunctional with every passing second. While Cassandra was fussing about eating too many Dairy Lee triangles, here I was getting worked up over the state of my immortal soul. Do most people worry about gaining weight and the health of their pets? Is that really it? Well, that isn't fair. I think my thought process went something like that. You need to tear up all your negative thoughts, Cassandra said again. It's a cleansing process, like detoxing. Yeah, I don't know about that. Come on, you can do it. I believe in you. Let those negative thoughts go. Just tear them up and don't look back. I tore up that sheet of paper without any real conviction. Cassandra tore hers up too. After that, we had something to drink, watched a, me a mediocre movie on TV, and then we had sex. A week later, Cassandra broke up with me. Buddy had died of a liver infection. So there we go. There is a first look at Lily of the Valley. It's evidently a visual novel. So there you go. It's different than anything I'm used to doing anything we've really done on here let me know what you think leave your comments problems suggestions horror stories down in the comment section below let me know if you want to see the rest of this i'll uh, record that and we'll uh, put it out there for you and see what you think um i don't know i'm a little interested now i still have yet to figure out who lily is obviously we haven't met her yet so i don't know it's kind of a de developing story um i don't know let me know what you think thank you so much for watching We'll see you next time.